All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our season finale of Nautical Nights. I've taken to making this a bit of a, almost like a TV series, but more educational. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us both in person and virtually. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. For those of you joining us in person, uh, much like at a cinema, please turn your phones down or off onto silent. And if anyone who's joining us on YouTube, <laughs> that's, what, that's the platform again, you're by all means welcome to join and interact uh, with us using the YouTube chat function. Any questions and answers will be brought up at the end of the presentation. And if the YouTube chat function isn't working for you, then um, you're more than welcome to send your questions by email to marmus at marmuseum.ca. That email address will be put into uh, the YouTube chat uh, in just a few minutes. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you for joining our Nautical Night speaker series. It's now in its fifth season and it's been a, a very uh, a very successful series over the past five years. And uh, thanks to our, our pandemic, I, I'd like to think that there's something that good that came out of it. We've actually been able to reach a lot more people uh, across North America and sometimes actually in, internationally as well. Um, so I'm very grateful to be able to uh, bring you season five and uh, also have it in person for once again. Before we get started, I would like to uh, state our land and water acknowledgement. The land, sorry, the waterways and land located within the Great Lakes catchment area have a long history predating the establishment of European settlements. The waterways in particular are to be acknowledged as the traditional trade routes of Indigenous peoples, together providing a network of trade and travel essential to communities since time immemorial. The Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston acknowledges the site it sits on and the water interacts with to be the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat peoples. We thank these nations for their care and stewardship over this land and water, and we are committed to sharing this stewardship moving forward. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel McFarland. Uh, Dr. Daniel McFarland is an associate professor in the Institute of Environmental and Sustainability at the Western Michigan University, a senior fellow at the University of Toronto's Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History, and the president of the Inter International Water History Association. I did not know there was such an association, so I learned something new tonight. He received his PhD from the University of Ottawa in 2011. Daniel is the author or co-editor of books on the creation of the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project, the International Joint Commission, and the Canada-US Border Waters. His talk today draws, on, draws from his 2020 book, Fixing Niagara Falls, Environment, Energy, and the Engineers of the World's Most Famous Waterfall. He is also the author of two forthcoming books. The first is entitled Natural Allies, Environment, Energy, and the History of US-Canada Relations, which will be released in August of 2023 uh, with McGill Queen's University Press. The other book, which is on track to be published in 2024, also with McGill Queen's University Press, is a transnational environmental history of Lake Ontario, tentatively titled The Lowest Great Lake, an environmental history of Lake Ontario, so potentially a, a, a speaker coming back uh, in so, sometime soon. So for those joining me in person and joining virtually, please welcome Dr. Daniel McFarland. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for organizing everything and having me here. So just keep talking. Um, and thank you all very much for, for showing up. Looks like the sun is actually starting to peek out a little bit now after a bit of a snowstorm or casting an interesting pall on things. So I'll try to keep my eyes fixated on you rather than interesting things that are, uh, going on out there. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking about today is uh, based on and drawn from this book on what is essentially the history of remaking Niagara Falls. So you might think of Niagara Falls as a natural wonder. A lot of what I'm gonna to do today is show you how that natural part of it may not be very applicable. It's actually quite artificial uh, in many ways. And a lot of that took place in the, in the period from the 1950s um, to the 1970s. So I'll, I'll be focusing on that time period in the presentation today, but I will go further back to give you enough context to understand that. So the book, first half of the book covers the period predating 19, the 1950s. I want to move pretty quickly through a lot of that, but, but cover just some of it. And so some other themes to keep in mind, aside of sort of that 
what's natural versus artificial is the, the tension between power as in electrical power and beauty at Niagara Falls. So a lot of its history is how, how to balance that tension. How do you get energy from it, but how do you keep it looking beautiful um, at the same time? Now, one of the advantages of working on Niagara Falls is that uh, when I talk to audiences, they usually know what it is. And in fact, um, a lot of people have probably been there. So by a show of hands, who's been to Niagara Falls uh, in this room, right? So the majority of people, which is what I was expecting. Um, I, it's still probably a little bit useful in case you haven't been there for a while to point out just a few of the features of Niagara Falls so that you'll know what I'm talking about um, when I go through. So I have my little, since I'm not supposed to wander around too much, I, I luckily have a little laser pointer here. So this is a 19th century image of Niagara Falls from the Canadian side, so that's Niagara Falls, New York, uh, on the other side. So of course, there's two sister cities of Niagara Falls. Today, they had some different names like Suspension Bridge uh, and Manchester, different things like that, but we, we don't need to get into that. Um, but the point is, we've got the, the larger Horseshoe Falls here, mostly in Canada because the border is running through here, but as I'll show you later on, where the border is in relation to the waterfall changes. It's not the border that changes, it's the waterfall that change. So Horseshoe Falls becomes more Canadian, actually, as, as time goes on. Um, the American Falls is, unsurprisingly, given its name entirely in, in, in the United States um, and in, in New York State. So the border is borders roughly somewhere around here. So Goat Island in the middle, that's entirely in the US and New York State as well. Blue Island's right there in the, in the Bridal Vale Falls. So historically, and I say historically because the numbers change, again, because of the way they're as I'll explain to you that they modify things, but about 90% of the water of the Niagara River goes over the Horseshoe Falls, 10% over the American. So Horseshoe Falls is much bigger in terms of how much water um, is going over. So as I pointed out, this is an older image, 1882. So this is at a time when uh, Niagara Falls, New York is the bigger city and the bigger industrial city. Um, so it's already by this time period taking lots of water around the waterfall for hydraulic power. So through canals, and then you can see the water pouring down, down there after it's gone through factories. So at this point, it's just on the cusp of water being used to produce electricity, but up to this point, it's being used for just hydraulic power, right? So but a lot of it's already being used at this point. There's a lot of schemes. They all involve, essentially what most of these schemes involve is you divert water up here or on the Canadian side around here so then you can use that drop of the Niagara Escarpment or the cliff to generate the gravity to make the water spin something, either hydraulic power or, or later hydroelectric power. And so because this was, because there was so much power because of the big fall of water, a lot of a big volume of water and a big drop, there was a lot of utopian schemes in the late 19th century attached to this of creating model cities, especially once electricity comes on board. One of those, schemes is by a fellow named William T. Love, who starts a canal, which is then abandoned a century later. You will have heard of Love Canal. So that's connected to that. I'll return to that later on, um, as it uh, does have a connection to what's going on here. But it, where Love Canal, as you know, as an environmental cat catastrophe, and talks of catastrophe comes from, is from a, an abandoned canal that had been built to take water for hydraulic power and create a model city with all this uh, amazing amount of energy that was blowing people's minds because it was uh, so stupendous. Now, there, there is a transition in, in the late 19th century towards uh, hydroelectricity as I've touched on. So this just illustrates, you know, this is just downstream. This is in view if you're visiting the waterfall. So there, there was already a, a lot of debate about how do we balance, and this is that tension I talked about, beauty versus power. So Niagara Falls is arguably the symbol of North America to Europeans, people abroad. Niagara Falls in the 19th century is the image they would most recognize. There's one study that says Niagara Falls is the, was the most repeated image from the United States of the United States worldwide in the 19th century. So it was seen as sort of emblematic of you know, the, the wildness and the, the bounty of, of, of America and the new continent. So uh, America itself, even more so than Canada at this time, was tied up in its identity being as part of Niagara Falls. I would argue, in case I don't get to it later, that in the latter half of the 20th century, Niagara Falls becomes seen as more of a Canadian thing. But up till 
mid 20th century, it's probably more seen more uh, to be more associated with the United States. Um, but so there's, there's a lot of debate about for people are coming to Niagara Falls to see this, and it's one of, it becomes one of the famous tourist stops, especially for those with means who can travel um, and look at this sort of thing. If you're looking at this, this is spoiling the view. So there's a, what's called a free Niagara movement, sort of a preservationist movement, um, mostly made up of elites and, and the well-to-do to try to do something about getting rid of some of this unsightly mess and create parkland. So in the 1880s, 1870s and 1880s in both the US and Canada, you have some of the first provincial and state parks in all of North America are created beside Niagara Falls to kick out some of that industry. Um, so at least when you're right at the waterfall, you're not seeing <laughs> uh, um, all of those factories and things like that. So at least you sort of have a, it's almost, I like to call it a reverse sacrifice zone where they'll protect the area right around the falls for tourism in exchange for giving over a huge swath of area a little farther away for industry. So this is some of the first parkland developments, uh, the state reservation um, um, at Niagara Falls in New York State is the oldest existing state park still today. It wasn't the very first, Yosemite was, but it became a national park. So this is uh, the, the oldest uh, still existing one, state park in the United States. Can Canadian side, they also, um, and I won't get into all the details of it, but they also create parkland on the Canadian side. So at least you can visit uh, right beside the waterfall and have uh, a more unob unobstructed view. But those debates about how much development should be allowed in Niagara Falls, if this is as this huge power potential, how much should that impinge on the aesthetic benefit, and the tourism benefit and the nature benefit of being able to see the waterfall um, up close. Um, by the 1890s, the first large scale central hydroelectric plant is opened the Adams Station um, on the New York side. So this also ends up sending electricity over 20 miles to Buffalo. And we also have the world's first ever electrical interconnection across the border with Canada takes place here. So this is, it sometimes gets exaggerated how much of a pioneer this is because there are other hydroelectric developments that precede this. This is the first on a large scale that then sends electricity an appreciable distance. So this is often pointed to as the birth of hydroelectricity that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you could say it's the birth of large scale hydroelectricity and distribution. So that's the Adams station there. And then on the inside, within a decade, the, the same American concerns that have built that are then building plants across the river on the Canadian side. So this is a contemporary image. So this is taken from Goat Island. So these are the other uh, power stations, which you can still go see today. This one's recently been reopened and sort of as a museum. So you can go down in it and go to the tunnel um, behind um, Niagara Falls um, as well. But really most of, the, most of the power because it's owned by Americans is produced on that side because Canada has more water rights because of the Horseshoe Falls being more in Canada, but then the electricity, most of it's just sent back across the river to the United States anyway, at least in the beginning, partly because there's no industry to absorb it um, with, within Ontario at that time. Uh, you have a case by 1905, all of, the, all of the generating stations in Niagara Falls in both Canada and the US are producing cumulatively more electricity than the rest of the United States combined at that, at that time period. So it really is an electricity mecca um, at that time. And since these are just some of, this is the atom station today. All that's left is the transformer station, not the actual hydroelectric station. Unfortunately, they got rid of that and it's basically a water treatment plant in front and, uh, there's old RVs and someone's dumping ground <laughs> or a storage area. So it hasn't been well preserved. The Canadian ones are in uh, better shape, um, as you can see there. Now, one of the great concerns for those who are trying to protect Niagara Falls um, was worries that it was, as well, this is to use their own language, was that Niagara Falls was committing suicide. And the reason it was doing that was because of natural erosion. Right? So because of the type of rock you have there and all that water, Niagara Falls especially the Horseshoe Falls erodes itself back very quickly. It's part of the reason why where Niagara, Niagara Falls is today is eight miles from where it geologically started thousands and thousands of years ago, um, further up at the Niagara Escarpment. So these images, these are years on these lines. So that shows you how far, several hundred feet, it had receded just within a few hundred years from when the first sort of settlers and Europeans uh, arrived on the scene. So, and so as you can see, the Horseshoe Falls, because of the way it eroded, wasn't always really a horseshoe changed its configuration 
a different time period. So this is kind of the time period we're talking about. So part of the argument was protect Niagara Falls. How do we keep it from eroding? So one of the answers was by all the industrialists who want the water for power. They say, well, if you divert water away, then there's no water to erode it. So thus, by us <laughs> taking water, we'll sacrifice and we'll take the water to protect the waterfall for the sake of the waterfall. Of course, the, the, you know, the motivations weren't were a little more disingenuous than, than that, but that um, that nonetheless got some play, and or at least it was uh, uh, an end goal that lined up somewhat with, with more conservationists and preservationists were arguing, which is what else can we do to stop it from eroding so far? Of course, part of the concern is if you've got infrastructure for tourists, if it's going to move several feet every year, which is what the average was, it wasn't always seven feet per year, it might be two feet one year, and then you have a big rock slide and be 50 feet another year but it averaged out to moving several feet back per year. So that's not going to be good if you have fixed infrastructure and you know, sunk costs into either power production facilities or tourism facilities and things like that. So a variety of different interests wanted to freeze Niagara Falls, the Horseshoe Falls is in place. So one of the main motivations or the ways to do that is the argument that we can start to divert water. If we take water away, there's less erosive power. Um, and then what we can do is as I'll get into, oh, a bunch of different engineering things that could maybe hide the fact that we're taking all that water. So it's an attempt to have their cake and eat it too. Divert water, but keep it from looking like they're diverting most of that water. So that's what a lot of the rest of what I'll uh, talk about is going to be about. So they're going to spend the next half century trying to politically and technically figure out how they can best do that. And in fact, it's the politics that will befuddle them more often than the technical sides of of how to do that. Because of course, this is a border waterway, so you're going to need both the US and Canada to agree on any change. So that's going to become a stumbling block. By, by the interwar years between World War I and World War II, the US and Canada have already formed several bina formal binational engineering boards to study how to do this. How do we divert water? And then how do we mask uh, the appearance uh, of diverting all that water? Because of course, there's uh, a lot of people who are going aren't going to be happy if you make Niagara Falls look bad. Not only the tourists, but the people who make money from the tourists, which is an important consideration. Um, what the, the engineers come up with is some different strategies. And I'll show you some actual blueprints later on too, of uh, different things you can build submerged weirs, sort of speed bumps underwater, different excavations, maybe chiseling out the riverbank in different ways. So you could uh, try to change how the water actually flows over the lip of the waterfall. Um, to oversimplify it a bit, at the Horseshoe Falls, the river sort of is shaped like a V. So it's deepest in the middle of the horseshoe. Because it's deeper, that's where the most water goes. You have deep water at, in the middle of the V, shallow water at the flanks. As you divert more water for industry, the flanks become dry, bare rock, uh, which is you know, something they were trying to avoid. So one of the strategies is instead of being a deep V, make it more of a shallow U. So instead of 12 feet of water in the middle, one or two feet on the edges, make it more just six feet evenly across. So that becomes, I'm just sort of giving some round numbers. Um, they, have, they have some different specifications. Um, but that's what they're batting about, investigating different ways of doing that. This is also showing, um, for the existing power stations that they have, there's canals and then underwater tunnels that are diverting the water around the waterfall. I, either it's the tail race after it's gone through the hydroelectric station or it's conveying um, water um, to the hydroelectric stations because some of them are uh, down there and then some are above there. So this is already the case, um, again, in the interwar period where you have a system of canals and, and tunnels. And those will become scaled up even more in the following decades. So Canada and the United States actually managed to sign a, a formal treaty in 1929 about Niagara Falls to allow them um, to undertake some of the remedial works they're talking about. I'm not getting too much into showing them to you because this treaty fails. How it fails is the US, US Senate does not approve it. It's seen as giving too much, uh, too much of a handoff to private power interests instead of public power, because it's also important to know at this, by this time, uh, power on the Canadian side is already handled by a public power utility, right? So Ontario Hydro, also formerly known as the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario, or HEPCO, which 
later becomes Ontario Power Generation. So that starts in 1906, largely in response to the privatization and exploitation of power at Niagara Falls. So the reason Ontario ends up with a public power utility is largely because of when it happened at Niagara Falls. And um, because uh, some of the power even generated that actually stayed in Canada was controlled by what we're seeing as Toronto robber barons who weren't going to share it with, uh, share it with others. Um, New York State will eventually create its own public power utility as well, but not till the 1930s, modeled on Ontario Hydro. So, um, but most of its earlier power stations were, were privately were privately owned. Um, so, because those some of those stations are privately owned, that this treaty in 1929 is seen as giving over too much water rights um, to those private power interests, and thus it doesn't uh, make it through the U.S. Senate, and the end doesn't happen. US and Canada keep into the 1930s, then they keep modifying and updating their engineering plans as technology improves. They keep sort of upping the ante and how large scale that some of these modifications are going to be. They do some really interesting things too, to, to de decide how to try to modify the Horseshoe Falls. They develop the Niagara Telecolorometer. Looks like a road surveying device. What is doing? This is the actual blueprint of, of readings on it. It's to measure whether the water. When they make a, if they divert more water away, the water becomes thinner. And so it's to measure at what sort of volume of water it's an appropriate enough bluish green color. So basically, they're testing for the color of water. They divert more water, see if it looks good enough. So they're trying to maximize how much water they can divert and still keep the right color or shade going um, for tours. So that, there's some of the interest in engineering and uh, experiments that, that's going on at, at the time. Also, in the 1930s, they're building new hydroelectric stations. So the world's largest hydroelectric station is built on the Ontario side, originally called the Queenston Chippewa plant and later becomes renamed as Sir Adam Beck, number one, it, it's still there today. So this is, uh, at the time it is the largest um, in the world. Uh, across, uh, across the gorge and a little downstream, the US is being well building what's the largest privately owned hydroelectric station um, in the world as well, the, the Sholkoff uh, power plant. In addition to color, the other thing engineers are trying to test for is people had been complaining about the mist and spray at Niagara Falls. They complained that they got wet. You could understand a little bit more when they were wearing Victorian gowns and walking down rudimentary ladders in the 19th century, which was the case when it was actually dangerous to visit Niagara Falls. But just to sort of foreshadow in the 1950s when they do remake Niagara Falls, controlling the water color as well as trying to control how much mist it makes or become one of the animating concerns for uh, how to actually uh, apportion it. Also in the 1930s too, uh, Table Rock, which you probably know from visiting the Canadian side, is no longer really there, even though there's a sign for it, but it used to be a, a large rock overhang. So that gets blasted off in the 1930s because it's deemed unsafe because parts of it have started to crumble, which is normal because of the process of erosion that was um, always going on. At the same time, too, the U.S. side is developing into sort of the epicenter of electrochemical production in the United States because of all that cheap power. It becomes very good for abrasives and all stuff, all types of chemicals. So aluminum, um, uh, the main aluminum company in the United States, the United States had moved there decades earlier from Pittsburgh. It relocated to Niagara Falls because of cheap electricity. So this time still, it's one of the industrial centers of the United States. And there's a lot more industry on the Canadian side at this time or on the American side as, as well. So this is one of the actual treaties from the or, uh, blueprints from the 1930s. So here it says our artificial cascades, light excavation. So these were plans for how we could, they could dig out the parts of the riverbed to keep the water from channeling to the middle where you'd have deep water at the middle and rock, bare rock flanks, how to get the water to spread out so you'd at least have sort of a solid curtain of water across the whole harsh. And you can, they also, as I'm about to mention, during World War II, they build an underwater weir, part of which is to help push water over to that side, as well as sort of train water towards the intakes for the hydroelectric power stations, as well as keep um, some of the ice away. So I, I mentioned already the failed 1929 treaty. The Niagara stuff gets wrapped up into the St. Lawrence Seaway discussions as well. Um, so while all this is going on, 
in fact, for, for pretty much the same half century that they debate Niagara Falls, Canada and US also debate building the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project. And as was mentioned, that was that's what I did my PhD dissertation on. And uh, that was my first book. In fact, that's how I got into Niagara Falls was stumbling into it by virtue of a lot of the same planners, diplomats and engineers involved with the Seaway were involved with, um, with, with Niagara Falls as well. But to so those diplomatic discussions during the depression period for the seaway so a canada us treaty is signed um, in 1932 well the seaway is the centerpiece of it um, but it also includes provisions for remaking niagara falls this also doesn't make it through the us senate um, so they go back to several more years of discussions 1941 rather than a treaty they didn't can the us decide to sign an executive agreement different type of uh, diplomatic agreement, which means you don't need three quarters of the US Senate to assent to it, you only need half. So that's a lower bar, but it too fails, mainly because uh, it comes right before Pearl Harbor, the US enters the war and basically anything, that are, anything that's seen as not being able to contribute to the war effort is, is shelved. So again, there was Niagara Falls provisions in that 1941 agreement, but it doesn't go through. Nonetheless, they still sort of informally, maybe technically kind of illegally, to said, decide they're going to build some of those remedial works they had um, mentioned in that in, in that agreement. So the submerged weir built in the 1940s is one of those things that they built during the war. They also sort of just say, well, I don't mind. You know, Canada says to the US, we'll take more water if you don't mind. And we don't mind if you take more water. So let's just kind of agree to agree that we can each up how much water we'll divert from Niagara Falls. So um, by the end of the war, they're probably diverting roughly about half the water of the Niagara River um, into those different penstocks and things that things that are going around those tunnels and that sort of, sort of thing. I think it's just me. It's always something. <laughs> Now, after all these failed diplomatic agreements, finally in 1950, a treaty is signed that actually gets passed and thus actually comes into effect. So this is sort of the hinge point of the bigger Niagara story. And I see it sort of the hinge point of the book. This is the treaty that uh, authorizes the remaking of Niagara Falls. And because it takes several decades longer than those earlier ones, plans have blossomed. They've gone through World War II. Now the engineering capabilities and expectations are much larger. So because of that, um, what's done is uh, done on an even larger scale. So this, what this Niagara River Diversion Treaty does is uh, outlines a set of uh, different control works, the International, Ni International Niagara Control Works. These are a set of remedial works. And just since it's simpler, I'll probably call them remedial works quite, quite a bit of the time. So that's a whole, whole suite of engineering interventions of excavations, weirs, dams, different changes that they're going to physically make to the waterscape and to the river itself to facilitate taking more water. And that's what the treaty also allows. Um, it helps to know the Niagara River is about, on average, 200,000 cubic feet per second. What this treaty does is, is says that US and Canada have to, all, have to be letting half of that, 100,000 cubic feet per second, go over the waterfall for the benefit of tourism. And they have to let half of that water go over during tourist hours, that is some specific times. 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. from April to mid-September. You have to let half the water go over. Outside of that, so during nighttime, and then um, during the fall till the spring, you only have to let one quarter of the water go over the waterfall, meaning the other three quarters are being diverted in tunnels and canals to hydroelectric facilities. So. If you went to Niagara Falls right now, because it's still the off season, you'd be seeing one quarter of the water actually going over, over the Horseshoe Falls. Um, at best, even if you go during the tourist season, you're only seeing half the water, right? So the very best, you're only seeing half the water actually go over the waterfall. Um, now I already mentioned those control works because if you're going to take three quarters, half to three quarters of the water, you would imagine that's going to have an impact <laughs> on the visual appearance of the Horseshoe Falls. 
And if you've got a whole industry and cities based on people coming to see it, that's going to be a problem. You need to keep the, the waterfowl itself looking good. So there's a whole bunch of things they're going to do. I've got pictures, uh, some words to give you some of the stats and then some pictures as well. Basically they're going to chisel out the Horseshoe Falls and the riverbed leading to it, build different dams and interventions to control where water flows to get that shallower U I talked about rather than the deeper V. And they're also going to shrink the Horseshoe Falls significantly, right? So if you have less water needing to cover a long area, if you just shrink it, then it's gonna look like it's uh, just as full, uh, full of volume. What they're trying to uh, have, and this is the language the engineers actually use is a, a curtain of water, right? They don't, what they don't want is rocks sticking up. You want an unbroken curtain of water. That's the main thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's 12 feet deep or what, two feet deep, as long as it looks the same. So that's sort of this balance of how can we get it looking full, just like it always was. No one will notice, we hope, that it's smaller because it's sort of a big enough thing. Unless you went there every day, you probably wouldn't notice. And lots of visitors are first time visitors anyway. So as long as uh, that two feet of water is going to shine the colored lights that they do on Niagara Falls sufficiently um, and have that right blue greenish emerald color, then the goal will be achieved. So easier said than done, but they spend the next several years trying to achieve this. So one of the things they do is almost 100,000 cubic yards uh, of rock is chiseled out of the lip of the Horseshoe Falls and the area leading right up to it. So that's, again, to make it shallower at the edges, so more water will go to the edges and less water will go to the middle. So you don't get, again, deep water at the middle and no water at the edges. So it's spread it out for that more even curtain of water. To shrink it, they're going to do crest fills, so sort of reclaim the edges of it. So cumulatively, it's 355. The lip of the Horseshoe Falls is shrunk by 355 feet. More of that on the American side. Um, and less of it uh, on the Canadian side. So this is uh, a bit how they do that. This is an image of the Canadian, on the Canadian side, that's Ontario over there. They've coffer dammed in this image about you know, roughly one third of the Horseshoe Falls to dry it out so then they can shrink it and chisel out all that rock. So they're going to go in stages, shutting off parts of the Horseshoe Falls a little bit at a time to achieve all of those different excavations that I've been talking about. They build also, uh, I've mentioned the Niagara International Control Works, just upstream from the waterfall, from the Horseshoe Falls. You can actually see it if you go there. It looks like a bridge off, off in the distance. Um, these are all, all different images of the same thing. So this is the view sort of from the shoreline today. It looks like a bridge. This is an aerial view, but it's a control dam with gates. So you can control the gates in different ways, permutations to raise water levels at different parts of the waterfall as well as push more water toward the intakes um, for the new hydroelectric electric stations that they're going to build. Image on the left is them coffer damming out part of the river to build, uh, build that. Uh, so I mentioned the excavations and crest fills. So this is a GIS map I created where the, the red thatched area is where they carve out. So that's when it's caught, when they've dried out the riverbed. They, they dig that out to make that part lower. And the green thatched area is the reclaimed areas where they, where they shrink the waterfall. Those also get turned into viewing stations. So if you've been to the edge of the Horseshoe Falls in your life, you were standing in the, those green areas that used to be actually part of, part of the waterfall. So this is an image from just a few years ago. So you can see sort of the training walls of rock that are put on the edge. So that's to help keep, keep it in place, keep it from expanding out. And then on Goat Island, this is the American side of the Horseshoe Falls. It's called Terrapin Point. Essentially, the green area that's grass, that used to be part of the waterfall. So that's essentially this area. You can see the slope going down. You can see why it was more or less a cliff. So this, uh, before the 1950s, would have been part of the actual waterfall. Now it's where you get to walk up to to actually see the edge of it. So that gives you some scales, kind of just numbers of how much they're, they're shrinking it. So it's, all, it's about changing it and shrinking it and also the, major, the other major motivation, of course, of doing this, as I mentioned, is halting erosion. So this is more or less the intention of reconfiguring it, giving it a facelift, and, sh and then freezing it in place so that it's not going to keep, um, not going to keep eroding. Um, this is actually, what's it, yeah, once it comes up, um, 
this is, you can see these if you drive alongside the river upstream of the falls today. These, what look like big garage doors kind of uh, tell you where the intakes are for the tunnels to the power station. So those are big gates they can drop down to close off the tunnels that are siphoning off all that water that goes for miles around the waterfall down to the power stations. And that's what this uh, map uh, actually shows. This is, so this is the Horseshoe Falls and the American Falls. These are the tunnels on the American side. I'll say more about these in, in a minute. And these are the different tunnels that abstract all the water, take it several miles to the downstream power station. So that's, that's what's taking all the water around the waterfall instead of, instead of over. A really interesting part of planning all this too was this would involve some of the, I won't quite, quite go as far as saying revolutionary, but groundbreaking use of hydraulic scale models to plan a lot of this. Um, so this is the actual model that's built in a warehouse in Toronto. So this is warehouse size. I have another image with a, with a person to give you some sense. This isn't models like this. This is a model that's bigger than this room. So this is done to plan all those different things. They want to try them out first on the models to see how it will actually play out. And the argument being that you, know, you save money, you do your experiments on the models. And then when you find out what works there, you go, you go put it onto the actual, actual waterfall. So this was pretty groundbreaking in terms of I could say a lot about that because most of the chapter in the book, but I won't get too much into it. I'll just stick to showing you some of the pictures. Both Canada and the US created models because they wanted to be the ones to get to do it. They argued it was for more beneficial to have models. It was really, they didn't want the other one to get the, the kudos for, for doing it. These are some, I know they're hard to see. These are just some photos taken at the time of some of these models. This is one of them that, this is actually from the 1970s, so a bit later than the 1950s, but it gives you some sense of the scale that we're talking about with, with, with the human there of, uh, of what they do. So models become a really interesting part of this. It does break new ground for models. It also causes lots of mistakes because models don't perfectly simulate things. They, they try to put metal strips on the bottom of the models to simulate, simulate the turbidity of the rapids of the Niagara River. They use paraffin blocks to try to simulate ice. Um, how the, that gate I showed you on the control works is designed is also meant to control ice. That's a, actually a major aspect of this because it was actually, today's the anniversary I just saw of in the 19th century, I forget what year it was, Niagara Falls went dry for 30 hours because uh, block, ice blockage upstream stopped. So that's the only time they think it's actually gone dry. Because even when it freezes over and you see it in the news, water is still flowing underneath the ice but it did actually dry off that one time. So controlling ice, again, that's something I say a lot about in the book, but I won't say as much about today. Um, so the models become this really interesting case study and the actual use of models. And then a lot of US Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of the, the technologies that developed for these models that then goes on to use with the Mississippi River and, and other places. Now, they are also to take all that new, newly available water that's allowed under the treaty, both US and Canada need to build new hydroelectric stations. That gets complicated in the US by the fact that the, the private power station, uh, the biggest one on the, uh, on the US side, the Sholkoff power station in 1956 collapses uh, out of nowhere, creating sort of a, a vacuum in terms of Congress to decide, should it be, public, should it be a public power utility or a private power utility? Uh, the ruin, you can go see the ruins of it still today. Um, that's what's on the right side. And you can walk down to it um, at, at the bottom. And they eventually appoint the, the New York Power Authority, which is a public power body to do it. And they bring in Robert Moses, who's the famous city planner of New York City to build the New York share as well as the New York share of the St. Lawrence Sealand Power Project at the same time. Because of course he's, he's pretty good at getting people out of the way, which is what they're going to do, especially for the St. Lawrence. Um, but as well, as well here. So they need to, for the reservoir they're going to build, they need to, they don't need to, but they opt to boot the Tuscarora Indian Reservation out of the way. So they bring in Robert Moses because A, he's racist, and B, he doesn't mind, regardless of race, booting people out of the way. Um, so uh, a little more about the models. The aerial view of some of what I'm about to show you, they build a gigantic new power station um, 
down a few miles downstream on the New York side as well as on the Canadian side. So it was originally, uh, the New York one was originally called the Tuscarora power plant in honor of the Tuscarora. And of course, they fought back against Moses. So it became known as the Robert Moses power plant. Um, the, so that's, that's him in the middle in the black, as well as just some of the images of them building the power station in the 50s and 60s. And some aerial views. So that's the Robert Moses power station here on the US side. At the same time, we have Surat, that at Surat and back, back number one that I showed you. Beside that, they build Surat and back number two on the Ontario side. So if you've been there, you've noticed they sort of stare at each other like gigantic cash registers um, <laughs> across the gorge, which this image I took a few years ago shows that a little better once the image actually shows up. Looking down river. Yeah, so this is looking down river towards Lake Ontario. So the, where the Niagara, Scar Niagara Escarpment is right here. So these are just before the Escarpment. And then Queenston is just, just down there. So that, that's what it looks like today. And it would have looked per, per, pretty similar um, at the time. Now, where we're at essentially is so that uh, the Horseshoe Falls have gotten their facelift, they've been remade. New power, new power plants have been built. The benefit mainly redounds to Canada. Um, actually, I, should, I think I went by the image that showed you, but when you reclaim the New York side of the Horseshoe Falls by 255 feet, they almost push the Horseshoe Falls out of the United States. It almost becomes entirely a Canadian waterfall. So only a small portion remains actually in New York State. So Canada, which is on the verge of starting to build all the tourist industry you now see, is on the cusp of becoming where you go to see Niagara Falls. By the 1960s, 1970s, Niagara Falls, New York, is already starting to fall in hard times, sort of the Rust Belt, that sort of thing. So it says, well, the Horseshoe Falls, which is really sort of the Canadian Falls, got all this. Can we get some of that money over here for the American Falls? So they come up with a plan to remake the American Falls um, as well. Really, this was more of a the powers that be, the city fathers, business owners. There was Lyndon Johnson has just launched his Beautiful America initiative. There's lots of money um, for city beautification. So a lot of this is just sort of a scheme to try to get money from Canada and from the federal government to pour into urban redevelopment within, within Niagara Falls, um, New York. Part of the reason they're worried, and um, this, I was trying to get this video to work, but it's not, but the American Falls, continues to have from erosion rock falls in 1954, uh, while the power project, all this is being built, a big chunk, the part you can kind of see here, right beside the American Falls falls off. Now it does it slowly over the course of a few days, so no one's standing at the railing when it happens. But this is part of the argument is that the American Falls, what it does, it's, it's a lot less, it's a lot less water, so it's got a lot less power. So, so the rock when it falls, instead of being churned away at the Horseshoe Falls because there's enough water to dice up the rock and send it on so it doesn't build up at the bottom. But the rock, when it falls at the base of the American Falls, so there's not enough power, it builds up. It's called talus. So basically you have uh, the whole front of the waterfall of the American Falls halfway up, it's just rock. So it's a plunge of water, but then just sort of cascades down the rest. So there are, what they decide to do is investigate, can we remove all of that rock talus? So it'll be a sheer drop rather than what you have going on there. So in 1969, they put up a coffer dam at the back of Horseshoe Island or of Goat Island and turn off the American Falls for a good chunk of the year. They don't, uh, you can see, you'll still see some water going down. It's never completely turned off, but more or less. So they, you do this to get engineers in, get geologists in to structurally investigate can we remove all of that rock at the bottom? Um, There's just some images. Um, really, part of what they're doing this is it's a bit of a publicity stunt, but attendance actually drops, partly because there's misinformation. This isn't the internet yet age, so people think that maybe both Niagara Falls, the waterfalls are turned off, so there's nothing to see. So um, that's why some of the city fathers had actually pushed for this, thinking it would be a big pipe a big boom to the tourism industry actually turns out to be a decline 
this year. Now, for those who do come, they put out walkways, so you can walk out onto it and you find coins and all these things. I mean, a little known fact about Niagara Falls is uh, there's a suicide on average there once a week. It's one of the more common places to do it. So they find bodies and things like that um, as well. They spent several years investigating whether they should hey, remove all this talus, as I've said. But by the 1970s, um, they decide not to. That's done for several reasons. One, it's going to cost 26 million, and they don't think it'll be a good return on investment. Making getting rid of the talus isn't going to bring a big increase in tourism, at least not to justify the, that figure. That population or a tourist drop. Um, in 1969 also pushes them, the ones we've been pushing for it are the ones who are going to be hurt by no tourists coming because if they want to go ahead with remo removing the talus, they're going to need to keep it dewatered probably for several years. So those business owners who wanted everyone to come now realize they'll probably be hurt quite a bit if they actually go ahead with this. So the ones pushing for it now say we don't want it anymore. Um, the engineers and geologists also decide that if they remove all that talus that's actually propping up the face of the waterfall, it might crumble even more <laughs> if they get rid of it. And then mixed into all of this is the environmental movement has, has <coughs> excuse me, hit in North America. So when they first start discussing doing this in the 1960s, mid-1960s, until 1974, when they formally declare they're not going to go ahead with it, you can see there's been a real mindset change, not only within the continent, but the engineers themselves. So the engineers who had been behind remaking the Horseshoe Falls are now saying things like, you know, it's a dynamic part of the natural condition of the falls and the process of erosion should not be interrupted. And it would be wrong to make the falls static and unnatural, like an artificial waterfall in a garden or a park. Now, considering that's what they'd already done a decade or two earlier, that you can see that this is probably justifying why they're not going to do it, but I think there is an actual mindset change where a lot of them are saying it's now wrong for us to intervene on this type of scale um, in nature. And that it would be better to leave things, leave things uh, natural. Part of those investigations that actually involved sort of contradicting how much they were into living things natural, putting a dam in the Niagara River Rapids below the waterfall. So that, with the idea being if you put a dam there, it would raise the water level up, which would drown the talus. Of course, that would also make the waterfall a lot less tall. So, <laughs> Not that benefit would be you could create hydroelectricity um, further downstream um, as well. Um, so as I've said, so, so they opt not, not to do that. So that sort of seems like, given the time, uh, probably a, a convenient place to begin sort of wrapping up here. So this that this has taken us to the mid 1970s. We've gone through the Horseshoe Falls, which they do remake, the American Falls, which they ultimately decide um, but they're not going to remake. So as I've said, it represents in some ways uh, an important mind sh you know, mindset shift for, for those involved. Uh, I, mean, I would argue this, this history represents a, a few other things as well. I mean, on the, on the one hand, I think what's been achieved at Niagara Falls is in one sense very impressive technologically and from an engineering perspective. It's given us a lot of Hydroelectricity for well over a century, renewable energy, which especially now with what we're facing with climate change and fossil fuels, having hydroelectricity electricity and renewable energy is, is a good thing. Um, it's also allowed us to have that while keeping the tour in, in the tourism industry afloat. Like, as I said earlier, they sort of have, were able to have their cake and eat it too, produce power and keep the tour, tourism industry going. I mean, a lot of people since then seem to, a lot of people do complain when they go to Niagara Falls that they're underwhelmed, whether that has more to do with modernity or has to do with they're actually, they're only looking at a fraction of the actual water. I think that I'm not always sure which it is. Some people would be disappointed anyway, perhaps, but there is some really, you're tangibly looking at a much less of a waterfall than would have been, you would have seen, you know, prior to the 1950s or in the 19th, 19th century. Um, this development of electricity, as I said, it was key to the development of Ontario Hydro, which became a pretty, a pretty big deal in the political economy evolution of Ontario and Canada as a whole. You could argue Ontario Hydro, public hydroelectricity is what helped conditions Canadians, condition Canadians toward an interventionist 
state in a sense that's making the idea of things like public health care and all that more acceptable. That's, uh, that's, that's an argument, that's not something you can prove, but uh, having uh, the state involved in that way, the government involved, I think sort of softens people up to, to that idea. On the other hand, so we can see this as impressive. I'm not as impressed. <laughs> I've gone through phases. As I like to joke, it was first when I first found out about this, it was like, uh, you go through denial and then acceptance and then mourning. And then eventually kind of I came back around to being impressed by going to it again, because I mean, you're still gonna die if you jump in it and try to go over it. Probably. <laughs> so it's still pretty powerful, right? This is still a lot of water. It's a lot of H2O plunging over granite. You could argue that by water volume, the real waterfall is in the pen stocks of the hydroelectric stations downstream or what you're looking at is just sort of a, a water chute um, for the leftover water that we're gonna make power with sort of a control, a controlled release. Um, so I've always been torn of what do, I, what do I think of this? I think this also enables a mindset of that we can and should control and dominate nature and sort of gave license to and confidence in the ability to go out. If we can, if we could dominate something this big and powerful, then what can't we go out and try to control and remake? So it sort of gives license to that sort of high modernist mindset that has a, had lots of other damaging, damaging impacts. Um, this is also intended to deceive the viewer, I guess, in a way, right? This is sort of, you, you can see there, there are plaques and signs that tell you this has happened. It's not completely hidden. And I think most people who live in Niagara Falls are aware of this, or at least in the general sense of it. So in one sense, it's not. I did an article in the Global Mail a few years ago about this. Some of the comments were, well, who doesn't know this? <laughs> Other comments were like, wow, I've never seen this. This is incredible. And others were like, of course, I mean, we all know this. Um, so I guess it depends, depends, on, and, uh, depends on who you ask. So um, it really does raise interesting questions too. After having done all this is, would you call Niagara Falls artificial or would you call it natural? Now in the, in the, the lang in, in academic speak, we call it things like an abirotechnical hybrid uh, and, and things like that. But what that's all getting at is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blend. It's not completely, I don't think you can call this completely natural, nor is it entire completely artificial, but it's certainly somewhere in between. So that I mean, it kind of seems like a, a good place to end, and I'd be interested in, of course, taking your questions and hearing what you think about whether this is natural or, or artificial. So we can end there. Did you want to? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's happened, and certainly our civilization has uh, benefited from the power. Right. But nature is very powerful. Argue that what we're going to see is erosion. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to see erosion and de degradation of the power dams, of the, the canals. And, uh, it's all being worn. Now we're going to have to maintain, and I'm sure the engineers are on top of that. I'm not saying that it's if the engineers are enemies, they're, they're doing their jobs and, and uh, producing a very useful product. But I Think nature overwhelms and Niagara Falls is an image of power. I don't know what to control that. That will, it's trying to level itself. So. Yeah. And I think it will. Yeah. And I'd say I'm most sympathetic to that viewpoint. So I kind of, again, I, actually, the Global Mail article I mentioned, my uncle in law got very mad because he's an engineer. And yeah. I forget what title they chose for it, but it's, he, he seemed to sense it was. No, the no. meaning of engineers and demanded I tell them to change it. But that, that's the engineering mindset, I think. Uh, no, bet. No, <laughs> but I'm anyway. very close from China. I yeah. can't see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all wearing oh, yes. Can we just pick the right. comment? Right. So, um, yeah, um, for the benefit of online, sorry, I was supposed to repeat questions or comments so people can hear it. So, but you were saying nature is powerful. It's probably going to win in the end, I think, if I'm paraphrasing correctly. And that, that's what I would say. I argue in the book, you know, I'm a historian making a prediction, which we should never do. I think what it's doing is 
sort of penning up instead of constant erosion, we're going to see a gigantic rockfall yes. at some point. It's going to make up for, and it actually has been eroding more than they admit anyway, especially at the, what, what's happened now is the feet of the horseshoe, that doesn't erode, but the curve in it has, has actually been eroding faster than they expected or predicted. Um, and that's just been in the last 10 or 20 years. There wasn't much, but just the last few years has been a few rock falls right in the middle, big notches of rock falling out. So without being a geologist, my guess is that it's, you know, you're something else. Actually, I, I should have mentioned that the American Falls, when they decide not to remake it, they actually staple it. They put rods and cables inside of it, essentially, um, to keep it from falling off as, as much as they can. So they've done some of that on the edges of the Horseshoe Falls as well. Yeah. Thought, uh, suppose our engineers do come up with, uh, with a practical application for the beach. We need Niagara Falls for that. And what happens to the power so Go back to nature. Right. So, uh, I mean, the yeah, comment was if we come up with nuclear, fear, nuclear fission, then we'll have all the energy we need. That's what we need hydroelectricity for. And I guess I, I, I would agree. Hydroelectricity is not as green as it's often touted to be for several reasons. One, I didn't even get into a lot of the environmental impacts of doing this because there actually are quite a few, not only the original construction when you chisel out a riverbed in the lip of a waterfall, but all that water is being diverted around for four or five miles, when you steal three quarters to half the water from the river, that has all types of impacts on what lives in that river, current flows, current temperatures, sediment uh, flows, nutrient flows, um, reducing all that mist. Apparently, Goat Island was you know, reputed to be one of the more uh, diverse in terms of plants areas in North America, and it's lost apparently half of its diversity. Um, since then, they never fully achieved mist control as much as they had hoped. <laughs> they actually they actually had some geologists at the University of Buffalo about a decade ago try to do new models because they were they thought maybe the new casino towers were now what was yeah. doing it. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Is that river bottom granite? Yeah, for most of the limestone. Okay. I mean, it depends if you because if you look at the side, it depends what. Yeah, the bottom. You got a good geological time machine if you look at the sides of. The cliff, of course, because it's different rock striations of, the, of different types. But at least limestone, the granite stays better as limestone that erodes. And then limestone sort of powders that gives the river its sort of greenish color. Yes. Tourist perception. <clears throat> you, know, you go in the summer in August when it's sunny skies. And Going in the last week of November, I think it was like outside here, and um, obviously, like you said, they're then taking more water, right? And it looked more primeval than it did in August when the sun shines. So it depends on how, as a tourist perception, right? So, so just, just repeat it, yeah. Um, you're, you're noting that. Time of year when you go makes a big difference, and I fully agree. The time of year when you'll be able to see it at greatest flow or half is, of course, in the summer. I've actually gone late November a number of times because since I'm in the US, that's our uh, Thanksgiving break. So for several years in a row, what we did was, while I was writing the book, is rented a place in Niagara Falls and met our family from Ottawa because it was halfway. So I've spent actually several late Novembers there, and uh, I know exactly what you're talking about with uh, less tourists too, which is also nice, but you know, winds and rain. And, and that's what I was getting at because I still, you know, I spent a lot of time there and sometimes you can start, maybe, I don't know if everyone does this, maybe it's just me, you stand at the edge and start going, yeah, maybe, maybe I could survive. That. <laughs> maybe I could survive. It, it almost is like a hypnotic mesmerizing. I've talked to other people and say it kind of does the same thing. And, say, hmm. and, then, and then you snap out of it. So that's like, even if it's one quarter of the river, that's what I said earlier, one quarter of the water, still probably going to kill you. <laughs> so I joke with my students sometimes when we try to debate, you know, how do you, 
you know, problematize what's nature since humans themselves are a type of nature and what's wilderness, how, how wild does something have to be? So I often come back to, well, if I feel like nature is about to kill me, then I think I'm in wilderness. And that's what it becomes, <laughs> or if I, yeah, there's an imminent death happening. So Ni Niagara Falls can still do that. People have survived going over it. Uh, most famously in the fifties, Roger Woodward, the, the little boy, I think it was seven or nine, it was the 50th anniversary of it was recently he went over and, and survived. Um, but you actually probably have better odds of surviving going over the Horseshoe Falls because of all that rock on the American Falls are just get impaled on that. So you got better odds of going over the big one. There's also, you can see. I don't think we should make that a tourist draw though. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yes. don't, don't do that. So you can find videos online of people who've done other things, some successfully. Someone went over and has gone, you know, people know about the barrels, of course, it's now illegal, but people still do it. Um, and then, yeah, there's tight ropers. There's a video of someone rode a jet ski off of it and did not make it. I think they were supposed to have a parachute or something, but there's actual video. That's easy to find. I love that. <laughs> I have a comment online, but it also just on that note, it reminded me of the new, and I'm sure this, this particular situation happens quite often, but. I remember it significantly because it was, I didn't find out about it until somebody, uh, a friend of mine in France actually sent me the article was like, can you believe this? And it was a gentleman who had started to like walk out into the falls or something. Uh, I think it was like no March or I think it was about this time of year. But um, that idea of like tempting fate or whatever it is. Yeah, if, if it's the one I think, is he wearing a windbreaker? Like something a purple like wind that, yeah. yeah it's from, just, I think it's from the night. like holding, like it's holding his like trousers up or something like that, I don't know. But it's from the like, 90s, I think. And so yeah. the story is he was going to commit suicide after losing his money at the casino. That's Changed right. his mind, but then got his feet caught in the rock. Because as I was getting it, it's actually not very deep at the lips, especially the American Falls, but even the Orange Falls near the edges. It's not that deep. So he's at the edge of the waterfall and the water's up to here. Oh, now this is also off season where it's only one quarter of the water rather than half. But what they actually did was radioed to the power authorities and they turned the water down. And then the, you can find this on YouTube, the video, because the news cameras were there. And then, so people went out, you know, the rescue folks went out and saved them. So they went out with ropes, you know, attached to them and with a helicopter and did that. But so they can, they can turn the water down uh, like that very quickly. They probably can turn probably they have the intake capability to turn off the waterfall completely for a little while you still have just because of you can never completely turn off you still have little bits of water go over but, but for all intents and purposes you could sort of turn it off maybe for a little bit um because they do have in a with those power stations i was talking about and i showed you the map they also have those new power stations they built they also construct gigantic reservoirs behind them so they can hold water there till nighttime or vice versa um, and fill them up. So if the reservoirs aren't full, they could potentially fill all of them up with the tunnels and turn the water off. So I just have a yeah. comment from uh, online here. It's more of a, a comment, but uh, has me thinking about uh, interpretation. It was, it's the uh, after Oscar Wilde visited Niagara Falls in 1882, he declared the waterfall must be the second greatest disappointment in American <laughs> married life. <laughs> referring to the honeymoon first, being the first greatest disappointment. But, uh, yeah. oh, the second biggest disappointment is the fall. Is what, sir? Is the fall. The second biggest disappointment on the honeymoon is the fall. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but the honeymoon itself, the well, first in, night. In, in America, you're in life, is what's right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I almost mentioned earlier when I was talking about people being not impressed. I, I was about to say, Oscar, there's a long, actually a long history going back even before they remade it of some people not being impressed. Well, Oscar Wilde probably being the most famous. <laughs> um, yes. I was going to say that um, a number of years ago, I found myself on the, in the Niagara and the American Niagara Falls. And my husband was at a meeting. So I wandered over to Goat Island and then the Three Sister Island. Right. And just standing there was you really got the feeling of the power of water yeah you're standing there like i'm here there's the water and it was just rushing past it, you know it's, it's American, side, but just you just got the feeling rather than standing you know over and you know, looking at them over there it was right there right and you'd really got the feeling and the impression of this this immense power of right. the water yes yeah so you're oh. saying 
how powerful the water is. And it's all, something I didn't play up too much too is right above the waterfall, those are pretty significant rapids. That, yeah. that if they were on their own somewhere else, like in Northern Ontario would be their own famous tourist destinations. Mm -hmm. Because if you look upstream from the falls, you almost have to look up mm -hmm. to see that power, uh, the, the dam structure I'm talking about, because it, there's a bit of a, quite a bit of elevation gain because there's so much rapids falling down to it. And yeah, the, the Three Sister Islands and all that was re changed as part of um, in, the, in the 1950s of, of how that was done. Um, what I actually tried doing when I was doing the book is I went out and I, I took a ruler and stuck it in the water there and put a mark on it and a time-lapse video and then went away and came back in the middle of the night to try to show the when they draw the water down and not to see it, to try to visually represent it. So um, it didn't turn out for a good photo in the book, but it, 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 was, uh, it worked for me to see, you can actually see the change on the ruler of how much, because I mean, right there you can lock right it's so how you can reach out and touch rapids almost. It's so it's pretty for those who want to get into the river. That's why it's pretty accessible <laughs> for better or for worse right there. I think, uh, I think at the back first and then we'll come. come to that. Yes. You go first. Okay. Your hands up. Oh, sorry. We've had a lot of talk about water eroding the escarpment. I've always wondered what created the escarpment. Uh, well, just geology. <laughs> well, uh, Is there this, a massive earthquake that lifted it up? Or? Uh, what could you created the original scarf? Yeah, Do we have an answer right there? I'm trying to remember. Okay. There's a big hole around the lakes. No. There's an edge to it. And that's got worn away. The water flowing down the Niagara River goes over the edge. The bowl must have been flat at one point. But I, it was internal, it was like inside, inside. Well, mainly it's glaciers and glacial lakes yeah, is what glaciers. creates it. I'm trying to remember the I'm trying to remember the exact which proto glacial lake it was of yeah, like glacier. Iroquois yeah, versus yeah, what, what have you. Yeah. I'm not remembering, but the Niagara Scarpet actually makes a U. We think of it as Niagara Falls. It starts basically just west of Rochester. The Erie Canal follows it. That dictated part of the route of the Erie Canal. And then it curves up around Lake Ontario, there of Niagara Falls. That's what um, the Bruce Peninsula and what's well, that? Why you have uh, Georgian Bay is separate from here, Lake Huron. That's the Niagara Peninsula yeah. cutting through it. Then it does a U, and that's what Green Bay is on Lake Michigan. There's the Niagara Scarpet coming back down and separating Green Bay from. So it, it, it's like a, a big in, upside down U that goes throughout the Great Lakes. But um, yeah, it's the result of. Uh, Glaciers and then the lakes and melt from from glaciers. It's a lot more complicated than that. But okay, so let's talk for another presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I will investigate. That's how it comes Yeah, I was going to ask. So I've sailed to a lot of different parts of Lake Ontario, and I know sometimes freakishly it floods to like an extreme degree. So if you're saying they turn off the falls, like police investigations and stuff like that. They alter the amount of water it takes to balance that out, or is that? I don't think they. Yeah. Protection? I don't think they could do it in a way that would affect like Ontario's level, um, because the water is still. Even if they turn down, if they turn off the the falls, all they're doing is sending the water still to the Bag River, but through the power tunnels rather than over the waterfall. So again, they have some cushion room in terms of those reservoirs, how full they are, but. The, the water is still getting from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario somehow. It's just a matter of whether it's going over the waterfall or going over, taking the detours around. Some, but it'll be the control works on the St. Lawrence River that will have a lot more to do with Lake Ontario levels than what's going on in, in the Niagara. And one other thing, because um, I know they do dump pollution to the lake. Does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are they able to? Like let's just say they overpollute it one year. Are they able to combat that by letting in more water to dilute it more? Not, not really. No, um, if they don't overpollute it one year, it's basically perpetually overpolluted and has been for right. The, by far, I think eighty percent of the pollution and toxins coming into Lake Ontario is through the Niagara River. Yeah. Um, some of that is going to be from the upper lakes, but as I was getting at, especially on the New York side, that was the hub of. U.S. electrochemical industry for a long period of time. So, um, 
they were already in the 50s and 60s, they were complaining about getting green foam blowing onto the made of the mist in tourist boats because you get so much pollution coming over the waterfall, you get churned up when it comes over and creating this weird colored foam. And uh, I mean, the Niagara River was, you know, in the early Cold War period, was seen as one of the 10 most polluted rivers in, on the continent too. So it's always been a, for a long time, it's been a very heavily polluted river. So I would argue that's, that's a direct result of the power industry because the industry that does all the pollution is going to be there if it wasn't for, for power. So I hence, uh, love it after. As I said, it's very much, uh, you know, a, a result of all this. And even Love Canal is just the tip of the iceberg for Niagara County, which is the county of Niagara Falls, New York. There's 13 toxic waste sites that have been identified there, including nuclear ones. <laughs> so Love Canal wasn't even the worst. It was just the first um, and sort of the most famous. <laughs> yeah. In terms of looking ahead, uh, in terms of economic forces, the you know uh, uh, the hydro uh, power generation was in a significant force right. prior to tourism, but now that with the advent of nuclear and, and other energy sources, uh, and the significance of tourism to our economy, that would you say that they that has uh, moved to the forefront in terms of any long-term um, view of sustaining the falls. The tourism would be the the so you're asking what tour the upper hand. But tourism have the upper hand. Um, in in the short in the immediate short term, I, I don't think so. I think it's still they still control the waterfall primarily for the benefit of hydroelectricity. But I guess you're asking if we're going to have alternative energy sources, would that give tourism the other upper hand over? The significance of hydro is declining. Adam Beck and all of that was major in the first half yeah. of the century, past century. But it's, it's preeminence, I think, has declined. Right. I mean, and, you know, with it, where is the cut point between the economic forces that are at play here. Yeah, I guess I, I would say, yeah, the power industry and the industries connected to it have stagnated in that they haven't grown and if anything, they've declined in relative importance. So in 19, start of World War II, 90% of electricity in Canada was hydroelectricity. Mm -hmm. That's where it came from, which is attesting to what you're saying. So, I mean, Canada, you know, the, there's talk today about Canada being a, a petro state, for example, because of and the importance of fossil fuels, but I, I've argued before it was a hydro state before it was a petro state, and that hydroelectricity as an energy form dictated, you know, had a pretty big impact on the types of politics um, that developed. Which is part of what I was getting at with conditioning people for an interventionist type of uh, state. So, you know, it has that sort of the mythical past, which is very important. Is what I'm getting at to the history of Ontario and, and Canada in general, because Quebec is, of course, a big hydroelectric province um, as well. So that so it maintains that because of that history. But I, uh, to me, uh, tourism is growing at Niagara Falls, especially with the casinos and everything, whereas it's not in the hydro. In the, and it does take a lot of work and upkeep, going back to the comment before about how powerful the waterfall is, to keep all that infrastructure in place takes a heck of a lot of maintenance. And if you just sort of left that alone, it wouldn't take the falls of the river that long to get rid of <laughs> or at least disable a lot of that infrastructure to make all this possible. And it would reclaim itself, I think, pretty quickly. So yeah, if I, if I had to, I mean, the caveat to this is that, right, since we're on a big push to decarbonize, I think that's given new life to hydroelectric facilities for at least as a, a bit of a bridge fuel in the interim. So where I'm in Michigan, they were going to decommission or in the process of decommissioning most of the nuclear power plants. Now they're all not doing that because that's at least seen as something in the short term that can help get off of fossil fuels. But I think hydroelectricity isn't going to go away soon because it's that type of renewable energy. You know, as I've said, it's not as green as we think because of all the environmental impacts. And it turns out when you build a big uh, reservoir for a hydroelectric station, it 
emits methane, which is a more potent mm -hmm. greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Now that wasn't as big of a problem at Niagara Falls because it didn't create its reservoir within the river. So St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project, it turned the actual river into a lake. And in fact, Ontario, Lake Ontario partly became the large, part of the larger reservoir for, for the hydroelectric project there. So you fly, a lot of area was flooded in the St. Lawrence River. Um, so all the decomposing plants, trees and everything, that's what's emitting methane. With Niagara Falls, they, the reservoirs they built, they built weren't built in, weren't turning the river into a lake. They were, they basically took fields and Indian reservations and different things and then built walls to make their reservoir. So it probably didn't have much in terms of methane emissions compared to some of the other ones we're talking about. But um, other thing is cement is a huge emitter of carbon dioxide and there's huge amounts of cement were required, of course, to build the power stations and all that work. So it's, uh, hydroelectricity is not com completely benign in terms of climate impact, but of course, any of that impact would have been built and done a long time ago. So even though I'm, as I think you can tell, I'm sort of indecisive about how much I really like what's going on in Niagara Falls, given what we need to do <laughs> energy wise, I would probably say, yeah, keep it, since it's already in place, let's keep it going. And, and in a case like the St. Lawrence too, the river has adapted to being that type of an ecosystem. So there wouldn't be actual damages to getting rid of dams too and changing it back to a different type of river. In terms of the engineering, when they, they reconfigured the horseshoe, you showed us where they were taking that uh, to create a, a broader curtain. Is that, the, that was the goal? Yeah. What was the impact in terms of lateral erosion on the sides of the shores? Uh, has that been, is that? That's where it was best curtailed. So the question is, uh, was erosion stopped at the sides? So especially at the, the I guess the feet, that sides is where the erosion was best halted. Less so deeper down to the horseshoe. That seems to, again, more water channels there. It was also, that part was less reinforced okay. and walled than the sides. because. Oh. If you go to what's called where Table Rock is today, which isn't really where it necessarily was, but if the building that's a Table Rock that you would now go to to see, you can, if you look down, you can see that's been channelized and walled pretty well. And I tried to show those, some of those pictures too of the little right. training walls. So, because there's more infrastructure and built up works there that keeps it from eroding there. Even on the Canadian side, because you can get fairly close there to the water. Yeah, that, so that part, that part has not been a, that part has eroded the least. That part, and then on the. Do they have side. to stabilize that at all? Yeah. So, but it is stabilized. That's why. So, it is pretty heavily stabilized because that's the part, especially you don't want to move because what if it moves? If you move 20 feet, all of a sudden you're going to move your whole building and all the tourist yeah. infrastructure. So, put the whole town on wheels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Everybody move. Any other questions? No, no more online. Okay. Thank you again very much, Daniel. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Daniel, for a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot and I'm sure we all did too. Certainly gives us some things to think about as we um, when we go to Niagara Falls next. I haven't been there in a long time, so I'm due, overdue for a trip, but definitely gives me some things to think about when I get over there. Uh, for anyone who's online, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, please feel free to email marmus at marmuseum.ca, and I will make sure that your questions get forwarded over to the speaker. Um, where are we are here? So as I mentioned, this is the last one of our Nautical Nights winter series. Uh, we are intending to do a spring speaker event. I don't know what that is yet. Uh, I have a couple of ideas. But uh, please keep an eye out on our website, follow us, uh, sign up for our newsletter, you'll receive those notifications about what the upcoming series are. And uh, that will most likely be in, in May time. Um, so while I don't have any more to share in terms of a um, speaker series perspective, I would just like to note that um, you'll find out hopefully tomorrow that we're um, getting ready for a, an annual event that we've started to do in partnership with a couple other organizations in Kingston. Uh, you might have heard it previously known as Dive Against Debris. 
perhaps it's a water community action waterfront cleanup there we go yeah right <laughs> nodding faces so this year actually we're renaming it as kingston waters cleanup and it's going to be again at Gord downey pier it's still very much a dive against debris event but we're opening it up to anyone who wants to help take part in cleaning up our waterfront uh, and there also will be a very much a community engagement part which we've been trying to build over the last couple of years so it's we're definitely going to be marketing it as a family friendly uh, day by the water, bring your family, have a picnic. There'll be some perf um, performers and engagement with community organizations like Sandy Pines Wildlife Center, Turtles Kingston, Swim Drink Fish, and, uh, and come take action. So that's happening on June 10th. It's all in part of World Ocean Day and Week celebrations and uh, should, should be a very fun and engaging event this year. So if you're interested in a round, please share it with your friends and family or come on down yourself. That's all I have to say for the winter speaker series and for everything having to do with the Marine Museum at the moment. You're more than welcome to say and ask uh, the speakers some questions afterwards. And otherwise, I'd like to thank you again so much for joining us, for supporting our series and the museum. And I hope to welcome you again either in May or next winter. Thank you very much. Thank you for last shout out uh you'll notice that uh, i have doug helping me so i would say thank you doug for uh supporting us <laughs> for pressing the go button on the live uh typically we also have a, a volunteer ken who is our videographer and unfortunately hasn't been able to come the last couple of uh speaker nights but i would like to say a thank a big thank you to ken for all the work that he does behind the scenes and helping to make the videography and the live streaming possible uh slowly have managed to learn how to uh set up the setting uh, myself but uh, Ken is usually a very, very big help, and I think he's still online. Hopefully, he's still online. So I'd just like to say thank you, Ken, and uh, thank you again. Stop now. <laughs> I grew I grew up in St. Catherine, so we were